Hello everyone, this is Dark Journalist. Tonight I have a special part two episode with Oxford scholar and Giza Death Star book series author Dr. Joseph Farrell. Now in part one, Dr. Farrell went over the strange Masonic imagery and esoteric Mars enigma. Tonight he'll go even deeper into secret America and UFO resonance technology, Tesla, John Trump, and the missing paperclip airship connection. Please join us now. There's a statement uh, that comes out of Rudolf Steiner's work. This is one of his quotes when he's talking about Madame Blavatsky. Uh -huh. And he says, when she comes over here in 1875, she goes to start theosophy. She right. goes directly to the mystery schools and she realizes that the mystery schools in America are running about 80% of the politics that were going on. Yep. And that she tried to get involved. And he actually says at a certain point that they use the Constitution in order to get rid of her. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but the upshot is that he suggests, and this is 1920 that he's saying this, he suggests that the majority of government is run by secret mystical orders in his period, to a degree that's even worse than it was in Blavatsky's time, speaking mm -hmm. about America. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, what does that tell us about the mystical underpinnings, for better, for worse, right-hand path, left-hand path, of the American political system? Then we're going to draw that around to the space program and the unusual mm -hmm. appearance of so many occult figures. Well, I think, I, I think it's very easy what it tells us. I think that the first thing we have to the first thing that we have to recognize is that these elements have played a much more significant role in american history than people realize most americans you know would scoff at the idea of the masonic lodges being so important to the history of this country. You can't have an American revolution if it were not for the Masonic lodges. How do you think and where do you think the people met to do all of this? Stuff? Yes. You yeah. know, <laughs> excellent point. You, you don't know, get the revolution without that. You don't, you, pure and simple, you don't. Without the coffee houses and the lodges, you don't get the revolution. Pure. This end of discussion. So this idea of the Christian nation, no, it's much more a Masonic nation. Yes. I mean, for crying out loud, we've got Masonic symbolism plastered all over the back of the $1 bill. You know, <laughs> right. you don't have to look any further than that. <laughs> uh, you know, you've got that hideously blasphemous picture in the United States Capitol called the apotheosis of George Washington. Oh, right. You know, and, to me, as a Christian, that is a blasphemous picture. He's an angel. He's an angel, and what's he doing? Well, you know, he's ascending to heaven wearing all of his Masonic regalia. You know, <laughs> come on. But come what, on, are they, what are they? <laughs> what are up. they trying to say with that? Because that was actually done later. It was done in Lincoln's time. Yes, I know. So, what are they trying to put back well, across? Well, look, their, look, yeah. Look, what you're dealing throughout all of this is a parody of, of symbolism that is worked out within the first thousand years of Christianity. You go into an Orthodox church, and what's its distinguishing feature? A dome. Mm. Who's in the dome? It's not just vacant like the Pantheon in Rome. Right. It doesn't have a hole in it so that God can peek down at us. Right. There is a gigantic icon of Christos Pentocrator, Christ the Almighty. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in other words, there's a very deliberate symbolism in the church. Now look at the dome. The dome is a symbol of governance. That's what it is. Interesting. And the reason why the dome is there in a church is it's symbolizing heaven and the governance of heaven and earth. Fascinating. Yes. Throw out Christ and put in George Washington. <laughs> 
Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the symbolism, the symbolism becomes rather clear. Yeah. Okay. Add to that the 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 history leading up to the founding of this country. You mentioned it earlier, Francis Bacon's, yes, the New Atlantis, which unlike the the way it's published now, it was actually the final part of his philosophical work called the Norvus Organum, the New Order, the right. New Work. Yes. Okay. Well, what's 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 Bacon telling you? Well, what he's telling you is if we're going to order society on scientific principles, we have to have a society organized on scientific principles, aka we need to start over somewhere. Interesting. Okay, so all of this, I think, yes, America is, is there's a reason I call it the failed Masonic experiment. Mm-hmm. Because what they attempted to do was create a system of governance in this country on the basis of those enlightenment and scientific principles. Fast. Now, we're watching it break down at a colossal rate here. Right. <laughs> and we have to be honest about this. And yes. that's what's happening. It's breaking down. But this is this is what they attempted to do, I think. And partially to their credit and partially not. But they they made the the best effort that they had at the time in doing this. So I think you have to look at America as as an experiment, quite literally, of the mystery schools, and particularly of masonry and, and Masonic principles. Um, there is a reason that so many of, of our leaders in the political class are Masons. So many of our presidents have been Masons. Yes, And so absolutely. on. There's, there's an absolute reason for this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and to ignore that, we do so at our own peril. Forget about this business in the history that we learn about this country in school. They they have been running this show uh, behind the scenes for for a very long time. Um, there's no question. Yeah, there's 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 no question about it. Uh, you know, if you if you go to Washington D.C. and go to the Jefferson Memorial. And you stand inside the memorial, and on the walls, you read a, these different quotations from Jefferson. And one of them is, I have sworn an oath on the altar of Almighty God. Remember that? When right. It's inscribed, right. Well, what he's talking about is, is it's not some wonderful little example of Christian piety he's talking about there. What he's mm-hmm. talking about is his Masonic initiation. Mm-hmm. That's what he's describing. Right. So, yeah. you know, why is it that the only Confederate memorial that we haven't torn down yet is Albert Pike? Yes. Well, I was going to ask you about Pike. <laughs> 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 because he comes along, and the period that he comes in is Civil War-oriented. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> he's giving us a whole different window on the Masonic aside, and it's it's a, a different graduated version from the American Revolution piece. Oh, totally. Yeah. Uh, Albert Pike, if people don't know, um, Albert Pike's service to the Confederacy was that he was appointed to the Trans-Mississippi Department by Jefferson Davis. Oh, and the Trans Mississippi Department of the Confederate basically that was all of the Confederacy west of the Mississippi. In other words, Arkansas, Louisiana, the Indian territories in Oklahoma and and Texas, and mm-hmm. then of course uh, New Mexico and Arizona. Uh, the Trans Mississippi Department was Albert Pike's part of his jurisdiction and his specific assignment for the Confederacy was to negotiate the treaties between Richmond and the Indian tribes in Oklahoma, namely the five civilized tribes, the Cherokee, the Osage, the Creek, and so on, Seminole, uh, which he did. It was, it was Albert Pike that negotiated those treaties with, with the five civilized tribes in, in Oklahoma. Um, and as a result of that, most of those tribes came into the Civil War on the side of the Confederacy. 
So his role in, in, so to speak, in expanding the Masonic experiment never stopped, really, even with the Civil War, because he was intimately involved in that whole process of, of uh, trying to bring some cohesion to the Trans-Mississippi Department, which, to a certain degree, he was certainly successful in doing. Mm -hmm. So he's a very interesting character. And again, uh, if you read into his life, he's coming out also partly out of that debauch line of... <laughs> Oh right, uh, yeah, yeah. You got to do some reading, but he's certainly um, dabbling <laughs> in all of that too. <laughs> <laughs> well, his morals and dogma is kind of like <laughs> it's <laughs> truth and advertising was not part of <laughs> <was> <laughs> not part of the program here. <laughs> Go ahead. That well. That book comes out, Atlantis, the Antediluvian World comes out, and Isis yep. Unveiled come out all within a 10-year period. Yes. And basically, <laughs> it's like a whole new wave of mystery yes. knowledge is out there suddenly. Yeah, yeah that, well, after the Civil War, there's this explosion of spiritualism in this country. Right. In fact, you know, that's the era that sees the first world occult congresses being organized mm -hmm. and, and attended in this country. Blavatsky, uh, Ledbetter, all these people are are part of this whole movement. And, of course, it, it really kind of spreads, in my opinion, it kind of spreads in reverse uh, back from this country back to Europe. Uh, but, yeah, the, it's, oh, it's interesting, right. Yeah, because, yeah. you know, you've got Blavatsky, you've got Ledbetter in Great Britain, A.C. Waite in Great Britain, Mathers, you know, all these people that prop up after this explosion over here. Mm -hmm. And over here, like you say, you've got you've got the Mormons prior to the war, but after after the end of the war, these little sects really take off. Christian science explodes mm. after the Civil War when it had yes. been kind of struggling along. So yeah. you've got all of this happening after the Civil War. Mm -hmm. And I think part of it uh, I think, Daniel, a great part of it is fueled to a certain extent by the Lincoln assassination, again, because that's what he was. Right. You know, and and all of a sudden you you, you make a martyr out of a guy that's attending a theater on Good Friday. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah well, that, that's a wow, too. Yeah, exactly. Um, and he, it's interesting because he is associated with Emma Britton and she is this incredible medium that starts yes. theosophy in America with Blavatsky. So we have a mystical thing there with Lincoln immediately. Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, and let's face it, there's a strange crisscross 100 years later with the circumstances around Kennedy's death and Lincoln's death. It, it is almost yes. mystical. Well, uh, look, at, look at Lincoln's idea, and we, we referred to this earlier. Look at Lincoln's idea of the union. Right. It's a suicide pact. Mm -hmm. Once you get in, you can never get out. Right. Now, what does that sound like? Well, if you are sufficiently familiar with medieval Roman Catholic theology, that's the indelible imprint, the sacramental character that you can never get rid of that is conferred upon you by your baptism. So in other words, what you're dealing with, with, Lincoln's conception of the union is the Roman Catholic conception of sacramental marriage. You can never be divorced. Mm. So again, you have you have this secular mirror imaging or reproduction, really, of something that the broader culture is attempting to reject, and yet it reappears. What is not happening, please notice, is no one is examining the underlying theology in the first place that sets all of this up to determine whether or not it's correct. Mm -hmm. Now, as an Eastern Orthodox partisan here, I can tell you, no, it's not correct. Right. That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> ding, ding, ding. Yeah. It's not hard. <laughs> You know, I but, think it's yeah. interesting. This this is almost like a war of the mystery yes. schools that plays out. There's uh, no doubt about it. It's it's a war of mystery schools, and it's been going on, you know, since the flood. 
Mm -hmm. It, you know, it really has. And like it or not, every religion is involved in it. Like it or not, every, every lodge, every secret society is involved in it. And you can, you can try and ignore this war and, and, you know, take your picnic lunch out to the battle of first Manassas and watch the fun and discover that general Beauregard has other ideas about who he can <laughs> shoot at. You know? <laughs> it ain't going to work too well. <laughs> um, let's bring this a cult yeah. stream around. And bring it into the 20th century, mm -hmm. someone who's heavily influenced mm -hmm. by uh, Crowley mm -hmm. and someone who is very deep in our the setup of our space program. Mm -hmm. And when you're starting to see that then graduate from, okay, it's an explosion of mystery school information, secret societies coming out and they're looking at an intense uh, materialism that's mm -hmm. coming into the culture. And so this mm -hmm. is almost like a reaction throwing it off. Mm -hmm. So we get to Jack Parsons, who's an mm -hmm. interesting person mm -hmm. in the middle of heavy duty scientific work and heavy duty occult work mm -hmm. on the other hand, but his mentor is Crowley. There's no question about that. Absolutely. And he gets to that pinnacle of doing this incredible um, Babylon working. Right. Um, but he's also the person setting up, in the background, our rocket program back in the 30s before the really hardcore stuff happens. And in his bio, and it, this is always hard to substantiate, but in his bio are long distance calls to Von Braun mm -hmm. and this whole back and forth of them when he just got out of Caltech and all the rest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, now, what are you seeing there? in the roots of NASA new to the, of the rocket program going into this occult aspect, because certainly Von Braun had it. Oh, yes. What I see there is an American manifestation of what I think is, is a more or less international, if not global pattern of people involved in the scientific and technological aspects of going out, out there to confirm or deny all of the doctrines of ancient lore. Mm -hmm. Because you mentioned Parsons. Parsons, Crowley, and for that matter, L. Ron Hubbard. Clearly, that whole nexus of, of occult mystery school interests exists. And I think it would be naive, really, to suggest that that was not somehow influential in the founding principles of NASA. That that those interests, those quests did not become part of the agenda. Mm -hmm. Because when you look at Von Braun and Dornberger and all of the people that are involved in the German aspect of this, they too have this mystery school orientation. I mean, my word, all you have to do is look at the films of Fritz Lang. Yes. And it doesn't take very long to sense that th these memes are all there and they're present in all of the so-called scientism and scientific nature of those films. There is a heavy, heavy undertow of initiatory type, um, response in his films absolutely and this is certainly abroad in german culture at the time but the <laughs> other part of that picture on the german side of it i mentioned l ron hubbard in connection with uh parsons well you can think of herman obert mm -hmm. as the l ron hubbard of the german space program Oh, yeah. Because he's far more than Von Braun. He's the guy that will repeatedly, after the war, tell the press, well, we had help. 
That's incredible. Yeah, he just comes right out and says that we had help. Well, okay, Herman, care to clarify? No, I don't. <laughs> you know, extraterrestrial help? We don't know. know. You know, uh, was it channeled? <laughs> you know, was it was it the Vril Society and Maria Orsic channeling whoever? You know what? You know, <laughs> tell us, please. Yeah. Well, but then there's the other. There's the third player, and that's Konstantin Silkovsky in Russia. Oh, right. And again, if you if you look and scratch long and hard enough, you're going to find similar cultural, mystical influences around Silkovsky. And you know you don't have to go that far in Russia to find those things. I mean, every Russian babushka has some relative who's a psychic who performs seances mm -hmm. or has visions. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's very commonplace. Right. You're in there, Ospensky, Blavatsky. The whole, that yeah. whole crowd, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, it, it, it's, it's so much a part of Russian culture, it's, it's not funny. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you you've and Silkovsky himself again when you when you read his writings yeah you can you can hear those resonances of, of Uspensky you can hear those resonances even of Gurdjieff at at times so yeah all of this is going on and then you know things really get crazy if you look at the Italians and some of the things they're talking about mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. Um, Tesla and his claim to be picking up radio signals from Mars. Marconi making similar uh, yeah. similar things and ending up, incidentally, as Mussolini's head of fascist Italy's UFO department. You know, Guillermo <laughs> Marconi. It doesn't get much better than that, folks. <laughs> you know, that's the real thing. Um, yeah. Yeah, you know, Benito couldn't have picked a better guy mm -hmm. for the job, but you know, what does that tell you about Benito? <laughs> yeah, right. You know, he was pretty... he wasn't clueless about all that. <laughs> yeah, he's plugged in. He's plugged in. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's interesting with Tesla again. There's Mars and the famous one, two, three communication mm -hmm. signals that he's getting. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a Mars piece. There's a Mars connection. Yeah, immediately with Tesla. Even with Mussolini. Oh, really? Mussolini, I think it's 1940, 41, somewhere in there, gave a speech. And it's, Daniel, it's been several years, so your your listeners are going to have to bear with me here because I'm going on, on partially faulty memory, but it, I think it was around 1940, 41, that Mussolini gave one of his speeches. And... He said that the United States has about as much to fear from the has has about as much to fear an invasion of the Axis powers as Mars does. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Benito. <laughs> Which is an interesting comment because when yeah. you when you really dig, you know, we have this idea that fascist Italy was not a serious threat or an enemy that we needed really to bother about. Right. Until you start really digging. When you really start digging. Wow. Fascist Italy, unlike Nazi Germany, did have at the beginning of the war long range aircraft that were capable of flying from Italy to the United States. Fascinating. And then turning around. Wow. Well, during the war, for some unknown reason, Fascist Italy was modifying some of these long range bombers that it had to carry bombs to the United States and back. Wow. And you got to wonder, you know, what sort of bomb would be worth fascist Italy to try to deliver to the United States? Mm -hmm. You know, well, the answer is rather obvious. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Right. And that raises the question, where are they going to get one? <laughs> <laughs> are their friends, uh, Adolf, going to hand it off there? Well, it's interesting. If you go back and, and look at, my books, I, I keep mentioning that at those early German tests, alleged tests, there's always an Italian officer present. Oh, that's right. Why? Yeah. 
Well, my suspicion is, again, we are told the, the, the Allied legend that Nazi Germany could never successfully perfect graphite moderators for reactors. Mm -hmm. Italy held the patent on the first graphite moderated reactor. After all, Enrico Fermi built one <laughs> in right, the Chicago yeah. squash court <laughs> because he took the patent from the University of Milan, an Italian university, <laughs> yes. with him. So in other words, the Italians never lost this stuff. And oh, by the way, <laughs> they were capable of making graphite that was acceptable for moderators and reactors. Classic. Conclusion, yeah. the Italians probably built one somewhere mm -hmm. and used a little uranium that the Germans supplied in return for supplying the Germans with the information that they got from their reactor. Mm. <laughs> so in other words, what I'm getting at here is, is you can't discount fascist Italy and particularly from this whole nexus of mystery school involvement in the elaboration of science. We've got Guillermo Marconi. Mm -hmm. We've got the Italian tradition of people involved in this sort of uh, mystery school tradition going all the way back to the Renaissance and Giordano Bruno and Thomas Campanella, uh, the role of the De Medici family in bringing the Hermetica to the West and translating it. You know, oh, yes. I mean, Italy is steeped in <laughs> excellent <laughs> points. Yeah, yeah, you can't you can't ignore it. Um, if uh, Mussolini, then also he has access to the Vatican Library. Well, I don't know that he would have access. Mm -hmm. He would at least have the ability to to in inquire. inquire. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. no, he he would have been probably in the position to in. Inquire because you've got to remember in uh, 1929 he signs the Concordat with the Vatican that recognizes the Holy Say and the Vatican territory itself as as a sovereign state, mm -hmm. and you know the rest of the world's governments quickly fall in line after after Mussolini negotiates that that treaty with with uh, Pius XI. Um. Part of that treaty stipulates that Italy cannot enter with its law enforcement or police, cannot enter the territory of the Vatican without the Vatican's permission. To do so is basically an act of war. Interesting. Um, so if Mussolini is going to have access to the Vatican information, it's going to have to be through the Cardinal Secretary of State, uh, or some, you know, high high ranking assistant there too, or to the dean of the College of Cardinals, which is interesting because your question, if if I can twist it, basically, is that Mussolini probably did have at least the ability to query. Right. The archives, because of the presence within the Secretariat of State at that time and during the war of people like Giovanni Montini, who later becomes Pope Paul VI and so on. So, and Mussolini, mm -hmm. you know, knew all of these people, mm -hmm. you know, absolutely knew who they were and uh, would have been able to pick up the phone and place a call and say, can you confirm or deny such and such? Mm -hmm. So he has uh, so, a deep inside connection. Yeah, know. he would have had. He would have had. He would not have been able simply to march into the archives and say, "Okay, you know, I need this or that." But he would have been able to pick up the phone and make a query, and probably got some answer very quickly. Interesting. Uh, Italy has one of the early UFO programs. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah Germany absolutely. has the early UFO program. Absolutely. Um, the United States is interesting in this regard because we know all about how advanced the UFO program was in the forties. Yes. But their earlier program, obviously it exists. There are other crisscrosses with things you've covered extensively, oh. like the airship mysteries. Um, well, Wesley has done more on the airships than I have by far. Yes. Yeah. Uh, that's the whole, the NIMSA piece I think right. is crucial 
when looking at that. Uh, right. Although I remember there's a section in your book where you're talking about during that airship thing, some of these landing and sort of yeah. <laughs> some of the people getting out or people seeing things like the name of a corporation on yes. the side of these airships. Yeah. So um, if you get into the early UFO program on the American side, and eventually the American side of the UFO program becomes the most advanced, or at least neck and neck with Russia right. on it, um, how much of that when you're going into you know, the rocket program, Parsons and all the rest of it, how much of a role does that play? Because we can even find Roswell as a staging ground for rocketry in the early 30s. Oh, sure, yes, yeah. I think... Let's put it this way. I think if you if you look at what Bosley has has done in uh, examining the airship mystery, and for that matter, if if you look at Tim Busby, you know the the book that uh, came out about fifteen years ago about the the whole airship thing. Yes. Um, and even you know even if you look at the Delshaw. Uh, paintings book that I have. Incredible. Absolutely. It, it, yeah, incredible. They, they really are just yeah. bizarre things. Uh, it becomes very clear that there's some sort, if you want to call it a, a UFO program, uh, be my guess, there's some sort of entity inside this country prior to the Civil War. You know, I would say... It, beginning maybe with, with with the Buchanan administration about that time period, uh, that is is investigating these phenomena and trying to create them. Right. What intrigues me and it it's it's one of those obvious things that you don't think about until it's pointed out. What intrigues me is if you look at the whole airship mystery, even as Walter Bosley has laid it out, you've got this nascent beginning of the Sonora Aero Club in the 1850s, prior mm -hmm. to the Civil War. Then you get, after the war, you get these airship sightings all over the South, largely, but right. not exclusively, but largely all over the South. Yes. And largely Texas and Louisiana and Oklahoma. Okay. So here's what's obvious. What happened to all of this stuff during the Civil War? Right. You know, where are the reports of Union or Confederate soldiers? seeing these things, much less having conversations with the occupants, which will start to happen after the war. Yeah. Where does it go during the war? Excellent point. Does it just die? <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, here's my speculative answer. And folks, please let me... Point this out to you. You're hearing this for the first time here. Please give me credit if you cite anyone on this. Mm -hmm. Daniel, dark journalist, interview of such and such date, Joseph P. Farrell at Mark or so-and-so said the following. Okay, there you go. here it comes. It's very interesting that these sightings appear after the war, largely in the South, and largely confined to the Trans-Mississippi Department of the Confederacy. Mm -hmm. Now, why do I find that so remarkable? Because what happened to Jefferson Davis? Didn't he go into insurance? He survived the war. Yes. He was slapped into prison for two years. Right. Right. And then suddenly released. Mm -hmm. Now, hold on, folks. If you examine the trial of the Lincoln conspirators that were actually hung, the whole narrative of the trial and of the Lincoln assassination was that Booth 
and the other conspirators had done this on orders of Jefferson Davis. Oh, wow. Now, I can assure you that if you know anything about Jefferson Davis at all, ordering the assassination of another world leader was just about the last thing on his yeah. bucket list of things <laughs> to do. <laughs> you know? Absolutely. President of the Confederacy, yes. Assassin, no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just yeah. not in his character. <laughs> But anyway, let's go back to Jefferson Davis. There he is in prison for two years. He is never brought to trial for his alleged role in the assassination. And then he's released and becomes an insurance salesman, as you say. <laughs> Over his lifelong, to the day he died, objections that he wanted to be brought to trial. Oh. Which they refused to do. Uh-huh. But the really interesting thing about all of this narrative, getting back to airships mm -hmm. and the Trans-Mississippi Department, when Jefferson Davis fled Richmond in 1865, he headed south, and if you know the story, he was wandering all over the Carolinas trying to convince General Johnston, Joseph Johnston, to stay in the fight and meet up with him. And what he was really trying to do was get to the Trans-Mississippi Department of the Confederacy. Incidentally, with a lot of bullion. And the question is, why was he going there? What was his objective? Yeah. Now, some people have speculated that his objective, and I think there's good indications for this, was he wanted to continue the war from mm -hmm. the Trans-Mississippi Department. Because unlike the rest of the Confederacy, the Trans-Mississippi Department was able to conduct trade with Mexico, for example, that was not subject to the Union blockade. Interesting. And that meant that the Trans-Mississippi Department during the war was able to build itself up to in a way that the rest of the Confederacy was not. Mm -hmm. Now, putting all of this together, I suspect that Jefferson Davis may have had some little-known, undiscovered connection to the airship Airships. Yeah. yeah, that was continued in that part of the country after the war. It would be a Jefferson Davis, Kirby Smith, look him up, thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> it was absolutely so there, he gets out and then suddenly you've got an airship. A lot of mystery. bullion. Yeah. 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 He gets out and all of a sudden you've got all these airships all over the South, particularly Texas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. So wow. yeah, I there's something going on. Given given Albert Pike, you've got these very strange Confederate officers that are associated with the Trans-Mississippi Department that yes. are personally appointed by Jefferson Davis. Interesting. So, and we, we need to remember that Davis takes with him much of the archives of the Confederate government when he flees Richmond, and he takes with him a small entourage of soldiers, his family, his servants, and so on. He takes even his adopted son, who incidentally was half black, Wow. And he, you know, the guy is very strange. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, in that era, forget yeah, for I mean, that era incredible. especially. But he's wow. taking all of this stuff with him and trying to get to the Trans Mississippi. So I suspect there's a lot more going on, uh, and it's pure speculation. But I suspect there's a lot more going on with the end of the Civil War than anyone wants to talk about, because you can rest assured, no one in the Union after Lincoln's murder wanted to let Jefferson Davis anywhere near a courtroom. Oh, wow. <laughs> they don't want it to come out. And, oh, no. Uh, it's interesting because <laughs> no. you've brought in the fact that it seems like during the whole period of the Civil War, the Confederacy is funded by... By strange, what? Who yeah. knows? <laughs> <laughs> Where's that economic infrastructure? Daniel, exactly? I, I have virtually every scholarly study that anyone has ever published on the financing of the Confederacy. And I have read them. <laughs> and I am left, interesting. Yeah. I am left absolutely mystified how 
how they <laughs> managed to keep that together for four years. A hidden Much source less of gold. fight a war with it. <laughs> <laughs> You've speculated the hidden source of gold. Well, there had to be. Yeah. The first, the Confederacy is is put in a position, Daniel, of of suddenly finding itself in a war with an opponent that outmatches it in every category that you can think of. Wow. You know, it, it's no wonder the Union thought that this war is going to be over, you know, like that. We can whip these people easy. Yeah. Uh, bad news, folks. <laughs> <laughs> How about years and years? <laughs> How about years and years? Yeah. You know, Robert E. Lee and Braxton Bragg, you know, they don't, they didn't name a Ford after the guy because he was a dunce, but, <laughs> but, <laughs> but anyway, um, nonetheless, they, they, they literally had no time to take an inventory and their first secretary of the treasury a German, by the way, their first secretary of the treasury said, you know, we're having to do this with literally nothing in human experience to guide us. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> this, wow. is, this yeah. is right out of the gate. They're, they're admitting this. <laughs> Incredible. Think, okay. But they, you know, they did, they did do some things that make sense under the circumstances. They, they, Clamp down on the use of specie as as uh, currency within the Confederacy because they're going to need it, you know, to conduct trade with with uh, international uh, partners. So that's you know they did get that right, but well, the also, rest of it. <laughs> <laughs> you've suggested that a lot of the tension with the Confederacy was over the railroad and how you know. Oh yes, absolutely. It, control the railroad, and well, I think that that's a huge overlooked. Oh, it, it, it. Yeah. Daniel, it's absolutely crucial because, for one thing, uh, if you look at the Confederacy, uh, the first in the the Confederacy has a first in military history. Do you know what it is? During the first battle of Bull Run, the first major field battle of the war, right outside of Washington D.C. Uh, you know, that's where all the Union families show up with their picnic baskets and they're going to watch a Confederate route, you know. <laughs> <laughs> forgetting, wait. forgetting they're dealing with Beauregard and Thomas Jackson. <laughs> 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 Little things like that. But um, General Joseph Johnston, who had uh, an army in the Shenandoah Valley, moved that army by rail to the battlefield of Manassas. That was the first mass movement of, oh, of troops by yeah. rail in history. So there were a lot of firsts in the Civil War, and a lot of times you're going to find the Confederacy in on them because, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. Uh, you, you had the, the, the transcontinental plans prior to the war, and again, you had both northern and southern routes. And of course, Lincoln is what? Lincoln is a railroad lawyer. True. Yeah, true. Yeah. So this he is knows all, what he's up against. He, there. he knows what he's up against. So you've got all of this you know, percolating in the background. Um, Jefferson Davis, before the war, had been a, a secretary of war, literally a secretary of defense. So, you know, these, these leaders were not chosen, you know, happenstance. Mm -hmm. yeah, right. <laughs> well, that it seems was, like there's three hidden factors there. There's yes. the secret source of gold. There's some secret source of gold, yes. A controversy over control of the railroad. Railroads, yes. And then possibly an advanced and flyover some sort technology. Of advanced technology. Yeah, that becomes the airship mystery. Right. Because we got to remember, that, uh, Walter does bring this out at some point, if I'm not mistaken, that that they approach Lincoln with some of this aero technology, and and they're not interested. Right now, yes. If you approach Jefferson Davis, who's facing an enemy much more powerful than the Confederacy, you don't think Jefferson Davis, especially as a former Secretary of War is going to leap at any technological advance that might be offered to him? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely he will. 
<laughs> wow. You know, the guy's yeah. not a dunce. You know, <laughs> whatever you've heard about Jefferson Davis, one thing he is not is a dunce. <laughs> it's just not. It's interesting. Um, if we flash forward and we're, we, we bounce right out of the Confederate part into the airship part. Yeah. One of the people that you don't hear about, but who possessed incredible technology is Warl Keeley. Yes. John Warl Keeley. Yes. And it's interesting because Keeley probably plays into this uh, Bosley piece. One of the interesting things about him, there's an account by somebody inside the United States Army that says he demonstrated a craft yeah. that could go. And the way that they timed it was 500 miles an hour. Yeah. So, uh, you know, this guy's operating in the 1880s. Yeah. So um, now this is the interesting crossover. In Blavatsky's Secret Doctrine book, there's a whole chapter on Keeley. Oh, yeah, I know. Yeah. In uh, Steiner's work, there's a whole thing about psychic technology operated by Keeley and how basically the mystery schools were like, the culture can't handle it. Okay, I guess we're going to have to back off on that because you're going to show the whole psychic secret around operating advanced technology. Well, even more importantly, the... Um... Clara, what's her name? There was a lady that was a friend of, of Keith. Bloom, Bloomfield. Bloomfield, yes. Thank yes. you. Yes. And she herself had a had a background of connection with spiritualism and theosophy. Oh, yes. Absolutely. Um, what I think is interesting about Keeley, and, and I think it was Bosley himself who brought this out in his book, uh, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. um, you're right that Keeley did approach... Uh, the the government officials with his technology and that began all the claims of of falsification and so on um i personally think that keely was probably legitimate yeah and the reason i think that is something that thomas bearden wrote uh prior to his death when he was examining precisely some of the claims of keely and that is that that Keeley had to be in physical proximity or actual contact with his devices for them to work. This is fascinating. Yeah, it is. Yes. And many people say that, it, that is the surest sign of fraud. What Bearden latched on to was that, number one, Keeley always stressed that this was a matter of, of harmonic principles. Uh, and and you didn't have to look long or very far to see that most of Keeley's inventions had something to do with sound. Mm -hmm. And I think it's that aspect that got Walter interested because Walter's father had told him about Wilson. Yes. And the fact that in order to make these things levitate, they had to strike something that resembled a tuning fork and create a certain frequency before it would get off the ground. So I do think that there is a an acoustic aspect to all of this, and we you know we don't have to go very far in occult literature to hear about Tibetan monks or Egyptian priests levitating things with sound. That's very very common. Absolutely, yeah. But what interested Bearden was this physical proximity, and what Bearden suggested, and again, I think he's absolutely right, is that the bioelectrical field of an individual, which is unique to each one of us, yours is unique to you, mine is unique to me, and so on and so forth, is that constant presence around someone will will structure the potential, the, the bioelectrical potential of the object itself in a particular way. Oh, right. So yeah. it's just, it, you actually are structuring a potential in these devices so that they won't work as efficiently or even at all if they're not around you. And mm -hmm. I think I think this is what, what Keeley probably ran into and probably was mystified about because at the time they didn't have any idea of, you know, an infolded, scalar potential that that was just beginning to be 
developed as a mathematical idea by Hamilton over in Ireland. And of course, Maxwell will pick up on that and use it in his equations. So you never get, in Maxwell, you never get away from this idea of a structured potential. But over here, it's not known. So Keeley, you know, Keeley is going to have to create some sort, of, and I think he makes some stabs at, he's going to have to try and create some sort of vocabulary to describe what it is that he's doing. Interesting. And he can't really, he can't really come up with it because he's missing this, this scalarity, this this infolded potential that you eventually do get with Maxwell. So yeah, I wow. I don't I don't discount Keeley at all. I think he he did something, uh, you know, like like so many inventors do. He stumbled across something real, and uh, when asked to reproduce it, if you're missing that idea of a structured potential, then then someone else is not going to be able to get the same effect, if any. Oh, that's fascinating. It yeah. needs to be someone of a particular uh, energy resonance. Right. Right. Um, that reminds me of the UFO file. Exactly. Now, this is interesting because there's lots of accounts of them trying right. to, yeah. with ships that they grabbed, right. trying to get it going and having problems. Uh, yeah. If you go into the Aztec case deeply, uh -huh. Uh -huh. there's a, a very interesting account that Silas Newton gave who was the main guy involved there who was also you know this kind of almost like billionaire howard hughes character uh -huh. and he talked about the first hands accounts of people who had come upon the aztec craft and how when they had scientists work on it they figured out that they had to run them in shifts of 20 minutes at a time because they would get sick around it yep uh, and then eventually that they had a number of experimental test flights of UFO craft where they couldn't get it off the ground or the pilot would die because yep. there's no connection. Right. So this is the thing that they were studying uh, deep when it came to crash retrievals and things of that nature. Now, it's interesting to me because whether it's an off-world craft or an advanced one here, that's a principle that seems to show up and it shows up there in the Keeley work. Uh, Steiner gives it a very you know, just like Blavatsky. Mm -hmm. And they're sort of putting themselves on the line because if he was just some guy who was, you know, uh, coming up with a hoax in Philadelphia in America, they wouldn't be particularly interested. Well, the other thing is, if he if he were just coming up with a hoax, pure and simple, there would not have been all of the uh, focus on him for such a prolonged time that there was. Right. I mean, he, he underwent several examinations by different people. Mm -hmm. And they were unable to reproduce the effect and, and came to these conclusions. The, the problem with the idea, and, and I hope people will bear with me, I'm going to kind of speculate um, on the cuff here. But with the idea of a structured potential that is bioelectric in nature, the... The effect of that is that whatever technology, as may be coupled with such a potential, is going to be basically an extension of that bioelectric, here comes the word, plasma body. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you get that wrong, that technology could not work it might run amok it most likely in any case would make you sick because it's it's something that's not you if it if it is let's say out of phase with your own bioelectric potential it might cancel you in other words just literally kill you like that mm -hmm. um and so on. So, you, so this is something that has to be very, very exact. The best way to do it would be, so to speak, to take a kind of recording of it and try to reproduce that. But basically, I think the idea of a bioelectric potential activating these types of devices is not far-fetched for one reason. If you go back to my book, The Cosmic War, one of the things I point out in that book is if you examine the Tablets of Destinies, they always appear to have been 
effectively used by the gods when the gods are either in close proximity or actual physical contact with them. Uh huh. And that's what suggested to me we're dealing with a bio, uh, biometrically activated technology of some the sort. Ark of the Covenant has a Ark of the Covenant, uh, a similar thing. Uh, even more so there, uh, because you know, if you look at the ark itself and its description, it's a capacitor. You know, it's going to build excellent up excellent point. Absolutely, it's yes. going to build up immense amounts of voltage. And if you ground it and touch it, kazam! You know, you're you're pretty you're pretty <laughs> fried. Um, I remember Graham Hancock. Uh, I did an interview up here with him, and he said when he did all this investigation, his first book was on the Ark of the Covenant. Mm -hmm. And he yeah, said so the amount of people who sort of held the technology as a lineage down through time would become blind. Yeah. Uh, sure. That's, that's kind of like these effects that yes. you're talking about here. Yeah, exactly. And it reminds me um, when you get around the UFO field, you get all those descriptions. And uh, I think they're honest descriptions when people Miss yes. time. Yes. Yeah, uh, I do too. So the physics start to operate in this weird fashion that has nothing to do with the physical well, do you reality. Remember, do you remember the series Taken on, on television a few years ago? Yes. Okay. Spielberg well, produced it. Spielberg production, yes. yes. Uh, they had a point in there, in that series, where they got some psychics, quite literally, to come and sit in a UFO and try and start it up and get it off the ground. Mm -hmm. Because they had at least concluded that there's some biometric activation of these things. Uh, and as a result, when they tried to do that, they killed the psychic, you know, mm -hmm. uh, that tried to do this. But the idea has been around for a while. And I think the reason the idea has been around for a while is this is precisely what they've discovered with some of this stuff. Wow. Uh, you know, add to that, Daniel, that you have all of the experiments coming out of the so out of the Iron Curtain in the Soviet Union, in particular, but also places like Czechoslovakia with the Pavlida devices. You know, these strange little uh, things that appear to have some sort of biometric uh, aspect to them that work for one individual but not another. Oh, right. Yes, we have all of the lore within. Uh, the literature on crystals, that crystals you have to uh, literally condition by having them around you and allowing no other person to touch a crystal. Well, again, that suggests to me mm. that what you're doing is you're simply taking that very faint bioelectric field and you're using that to impress a, uh, a structured potential on the crystal. Mm -hmm. which is already a structured potential because of its crystal and lattice. Right. So, you know, what are we? What's DNA? If it's an, yes. op, it's an aperiodic crystal. Yeah, absolutely. And it's fascinating um, because we've touched on the two-eye stone crystal yes. idea. Yes. What's interesting to me is um, when Casey says, well, they, you know, part of the problem with Atlantis, part of the destruction was they accidentally set the crystal too high and that broke up the island, the continent into three islands. Yeah. Um, what does that suggest to you? It set off volcanoes. It set off eruptions. Resonance. Resonance, exactly. Resonance yes. that they were not able to damp. Wow. Yeah, yeah. incredible. If you, if you want to know what resonance can do, go look at those old films of Galloping Gertie. You know, mm -hmm. the, the suspension bridge that was at the Tacoma Narrows. All of that is resonance. Wow. All of it. Yeah. All yeah. of it. And it gets to the point that the bridge itself cannot damp all of the vibrations that are going on. And the wind just happened to be blowing at exactly the right enough speed to cause that torsion motion in the length of, of the main span of the bridge. And because that motion got started and the bridge couldn't damp, energy kept loading into it until, you know, it finally just collapsed. Wow. So wow. The, col the collapse itself is the damping that finally takes place. You can go online and see, uh, you can go online and see the Verrazano Narrows Bridge in New York 
in certain conditions of wind, you can see it doing this because the wind establishes a resonance with the bridge. And, you know, the bridge needs, don't get me wrong, folks, I'm not saying the bridge is unsound. If the bridge doesn't do that, it will collapse. You right. know, if, if the wings on your airplane don't flap a little bit as it's moving along, the plane ain't going to fly. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know? compensating, yeah. Yeah, it's compensating for the, for the natural vibrations of, of the environment. But yeah, I, I entirely can can uh, understand why why Casey would have said that because it's a resonance effect. It's it's very simple. If you if you can't damp it, it's gonna it's gonna do something like that. Absolutely. It's interesting to me that he ascribes the destruction to the power station of the two I mm -hmm. as the Atlantean main power source. And that mm -hmm. that sets off the original thing and that they have a chance to rebuild. They still rebuild after the fact, but again, it is, it's the setup of those crystals that eventually do the Island in. Well, remember what Tesla said during his Wardenclyffe uh, experiments. I can set the earth into such a state of vibration that I could split the planet. Incredible. Now, if you're playing around with an electrical device that is using the planet itself as the antenna to beam the, he's not beaming the power out through the atmosphere, folks, get that idea out of your head. That's not what he was doing. That's what they always say. That's what they always say, but that's yeah. not what he's doing. The power, the ground is, is connecting the, completing the circuit. So the power is coming back into the tower through the atmosphere, but it's going out through the earth. Wow. That's what he's doing. Mm -hmm. He's playing with the planet. <laughs> <laughs> I have to mention here, I'm so glad you brought up Tesla. And it's weird because uh, President Trump recently at a campaign event, again, two days ago, he mentions yep. Uncle yep. John. And we know Uncle John uh, was sent in by Vannevar Bush to pick up the Tesla files and yep. stuck in them for information about taking down flying objects at a distance. That yep. was, those were his instructions. Yep. Um, but when we get around Tesla, there's something very interesting that Gordon Cooper, uh, the astronaut, put on the record. Mm. And he said that he felt, and he was out of NASA, so he had the ability to kind of shoot from the hip, mm. but he felt the development of Star Wars during the Reagan administration, SDI, mm -hmm. was not put up there to zap nuclear missiles at all, but it came about as the result of one of the trunks, part of the information of Tesla's information on ELF, extremely low frequency vibration weapons, had somehow made it to Russia. At least that was the supposition. And so they built this as a barrier against it because they were developing the same types of weapon and they oh, yeah. knew the power, uh, that kind of having the earth uh, type power that you were discussing there. What do you think, again, you know, we've heard things about SDI that have nothing to do with nuclear missiles like in Corso's work. It seems right. highly plausible Right. That somehow they were set up there to deflect something, you know, dealing maybe directly with the UFO file. But um, what do you think of the Cooper's suggestion? And again, could putting SDI up there have made us a bigger target for anyone else who was, you know, oh, sure. hanging out there? Um, the connecting link with all of the, the connecting link to the UFO with all of this. And by all of this, I'm including the explosion of nuclear weapons. Okay. Mm -hmm. The connecting link with all of this are precisely longitudinal pulses in the medium of space-time itself. Oh, right. So, in other words, when you develop a technology that by whatever means is, is playing around with electroacoustic waves in the medium, and let's remember now what that medium may be. That medium may be a plasma. Okay. Once you're dealing with electroacoustic waves in a medium that extends everywhere, that pulse that you send out, if you have the technology to produce it, you might have the technology to pick up those kinds of pulses. And you're going to be able to pick them up 
within a let's put it this way within a very short time and you're going to be able to by the nature of the case if you have two or more such receivers you're going to be able to pinpoint the source extremely well just like you can pinpoint the epicenter of an earthquake by different seismograms located around the world and the time it takes for that pulse to reach them and so on and so forth, you're going to be able to do the same thing with a longitudinal pulse in the medium. You're going to be able to pinpoint the source with a great deal of exactitude. And if you have the technology to do all that, you might have the technology to go visit and check things out too. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think it's not accidental that the modern recurrence of UFOs, which notches up, if you look at all UFO or alleged UFO incidents over human history, including all those paintings of strange little things in the sky, Mm -hmm. they ratchet up very dramatically toward the end of World War II. There's no denying this. Absolutely. Yeah. And what happens in world at right around 1944, by the way, folks, what happens then? Well, the first nuclear explosions happen then. Mm-hmm. And if you include Tesla with this in his his uh wireless power experiments, you have a similar ratcheting up earlier than that of UFO appearances. So I think yes. All of this technology, which has that one thing in common, attracted somebody's attention. Mm -hmm. And they decided, we better go check out the monkeys. And if they have lore, like we do, of such prior incidents, then they're going to be thinking, oh, the monkeys are at it again. We really got to go check them out. (laughs) We remember, yeah. Yeah, and and put a stop to it if necessary. (laughs) (laughs) Because we know what those little guys are going to do with it. <laughs> mm. You know, yeah, I, I, I'm not surprised by any of it. And I think that's the connecting link. Do the Russians have it? Of course they do. Mm-hmm. Of course they do. Yeah. They're not stupid folks. <laughs> right. Do the Chinese? Probably. You know, yeah. I mean, come on. Um, If anything, what I've been trying to suggest tonight is if you look at countries like Russia or China or India, their entire cosmological, religio-scientific tradition is very different than the West and is much more open to entertaining these wild types of pseudoscience than we are. Wow. Absolutely they are. It's a crucial mindset. It is to a be open to it, yes. and they've closed us off yeah. in the Western culture. Yeah, from doing it, they've attempted to. And, they've attempted to. Well, they've yeah. attempted to close us off, and you know, while they secretly develop, but exactly. in those cultures, it's almost impossible to close it off because it's part of their literature. It's part mm. of their. It's part of you know. Think of India, and the Vedas. There are hundreds of volumes. Of, of Vedic literature in the Sanskrit. Hundreds. Wow. And we have basically just scratched the surface of translation. I mean, there the is no historic even, identity. Yeah. Right. I don't think there's even an, an English translation of the entire Mahabharata. Wow. You know, the, the great Hindu epic. I, you know, and you want an epic with all sorts of strange technology described. <laughs> 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 that's it folks no, how about uh, yeah disintegrate an elephant from the sky that's yeah nice. <laughs> how to do it <laughs> here's the recipe um you know uh it, it's so much a part of their their outlook and culture fascinating that, you know and and the same with china the same with russia uh, it, it's difficult to cover these things up. That's why, you know, Russian astronomers and PhDs can get away with proposing the moon as a spaceship in Sputnik magazine. It, it's, <laughs> it's kind of second nature to think this way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is very interesting because it reminds me of a conversation I had with Russell Targ yeah. about Werner von Braun. 
Oh boy. <laughs> Braun, <laughs> one of the first thing is that von Braun's mother was a well-known psychic. Psychic, in yes. Germany. Yes. Um, and it had incredible predictive abilities. People would come to her about the weather, things right. of this nature. So, but von Braun asked Targ to develop an ESP testing device specifically for NASA astronauts. Oh, I can believe that. And this again it has that tie over with the psychic aspect being utilized in the pursuit of space travel. Yep. Somehow the two are related. And when you get yep. around that exotic technology, whether it's UFO redevelopment or homegrown, uh, it seems like the psychic aspect is deep in there. And it is with von Braun. I've even heard something. Um, I think I may have mentioned this maybe about a year ago in some interview that we did. Yeah. It was either you or somebody else. I think it was you. I've heard something very interesting concerning, pardon me, astronauts in space. I heard it from John Rappaport uh, oh. when we were at the uh, yeah. San Mateo Secret Space Program mm -hmm. conference. And that was, he. we were sitting out at the motel uh, on the balconies and just smoking and, you know, chatting. And we got talking about uh, psychic abilities. And he mentioned that astronauts, both Russian and American, had reported when they were up there, you know, in, in orbit, having all of these very strange visions of their lost dead relatives that's it, yes. Including people that, you know, they had no idea were ancestors of theirs. You know, and this appeared to be a fairly universal thing. And it's not very widely talked about. And I said, well, that's interesting that this would happen outside the gravity well of the Earth. Wow. And I think maybe that has something to do with, with all of this. Uh, and then you get that that very interesting, and that Von Braun would do this, especially with his mother's background, doesn't surprise me at all. Because, incidentally, the Russians tried a similar thing with some of their cosmonauts and trying to figure out if there was some sort of ESP thing that was, was going on with space. And apparently, from what I remember right off the top of my head, that experiment was also wildly successful. Wow. Incredible. That they discovered somehow being up there increased your ability to do these things. That really makes sense. It really does when you yeah. start to think about it. So what I wanted, you know, what I'm thinking of in terms of a, a potential experiment is... I wish, you know, they could take some of these extremely experienced remote viewers like Lynn Buchanan or, or Joseph McConaughey or people like that and, you know, put them up there and then have them do a remote viewing to see if somehow, you know, do, design some Amplified. sort of test. Yeah, yes. to see if that ability is enhanced or damped up there in space. My guess would be that it's enhanced a great idea and that's fascinating about the astronauts seeing their dead relatives because instantly you're sort of past the bonds of earthly right. you know materialistic thinking right. you're in this other field and all those senses that are inside they're latent they're not manifested on a normal basis then all of a sudden boom they're well there. it's it's a, an odd sort of confirmation of something else it's an odd sort of confirmation of the slavonic text of the book of enoch why um, yes because in the book of enoch and the slavonic text of it you read that the the departed souls go to that place that is between the Earth and the Moon, bounded by the orbit of the Moon. That's mm. where they are. It comes wow. right out and says it. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And, you know, how in the name of sense does someone writing 2,000 years ago come up, even at that time, with such a cockamamie <laughs> 
idea. What I love is when you get into the book of Enoch and he's, he, you know, he gets on one of these ships and it's yeah. straight up and he's looking down and he says like, Hey, look, the earth looks like porridge. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's pretty good. That's a UFO contactee. Uh, Joseph, I, to round all this around, I'm going to uh -huh. mention a book here, uh -huh. um, which I found out was Von Braun's favorite book. Okay. It's called Two Planets, a novel by Kurt Lossvitz. Um, and the Von Braun quote is, I shall never forget how I devoured this novel with curiosity and excitement as a young man. Um, it's all about these Martians that come <laughs> here, a sophisticated civilization, and they decide the only place that's habitable for them is Antarctica. Oh. <laughs> I just want to read you one uh, little bit about, uh, you know, two planets. So he's a mathematician, the author. He publishes it in 1897. Uh -huh. And uh, the upshot is man's first encounter with beings from another planet. Uh, the Martians differ little from man physically, but ethically, intellectually, scientifically, and socially. They are the prototype of the ideal human being. They seek to educate man, asking in return only air and energy. This is just some of the names of the table of contents. Secrets of the Pole, <laughs> the inhabitants of Mars, uh -huh. the artificial island, <laughs> the masters of the universe, the space travelers, the message of the Martian states, the new airship, and uh, the secret of the pole. What's the name of this book again? It's Two Planets by Kurt Lossvitz, and it only got over here to America in 1972 oh. with an English translation. <laughs> so it was around there on the oh, European God. German side. They knew of it. Von Braun, it was his favorite. Uh -huh. uh, in the Von Braun Cooper relationship, Cooper talks a lot about Von Braun talking about Mars. Everything is about Mars. He's going to get to Mars. The moon is only a step to Mars. Mm -hmm. And um, he has him so convinced that actually Cooper thinks he's going to lead a mission to Mars and that it'll happen by 1981. Mm -hmm. So that's the timetable that mm -hmm. they've laid out. Um, and he talks about how it gets scrapped and how it got scrapped by a senator from Wisconsin who took over for Joseph McCarthy and was married to a Rockefeller. Rockefeller? That's him. You've got to be kidding me. No. He's the one who scrapped it. Oh, I'm not surprised. <laughs> and married to the granddaughter of... John D. Rockefeller's brother, William. Wow. Okay, I'll tell you why I'm I'm intrigued by this, uh, what you've discovered here. Um, let, let's just go with the radical high octane off the end of the tree. <laughs> yes. While E. Coyote dive into the canyon. <laughs> okay. Go for it. Um. You recall that during the uh, Clinton administration, President Clinton gave a talk in the Rose Garden, I think it was, where he disclosed, made a big announcement that there was life on Mars. Oh, right. Because they had found a meteor from Mars right. in Antarctica. And in the meteor were little fossils of bacteria or something alive, and the meteor had come from Mars. Unbelievable, yes. Now, we were not told at the time, how do we know this meteor is from Mars? <laughs> um, there's that. Then there's all of the high strangeness, which you know, we you and I have talked about many times about Antarctica. I've blogged endlessly about it. Uh, I in fact I think I have a blog either last week or this week about Antarctica yet again. Wow. 
Um, and all of the strange people that have been there or associated with it, Herman Goering, Rudolf Hess, Admiral Byrd, Buzz Aldrin, Secretary of State John Ketchup Carey, <laughs> King Juan Carlos, wow. uh, Patriarch Kirill of Moscow, and now the Pope wants to go. <laughs> wow. Oh. And I want to say this, that you were so on top of this, you're blogging about it and putting out all this stuff about Antarctica maybe 10 years ago. Oh, yeah. And it got so picked up and bastardized in so oh, many yeah. like bizarre ways by Gaia TV and all this nonsense. Yeah. Let me tell you, you took the core of it, which was the original high jump thing, and then correlated all these strange visits and the things that were happening. Right. That's fascinating. So now you're bringing Clinton in. Well, Clinton and the Mars thing. What I'm suggesting here is that the the novel that Von Braun knew as a boy, mm. this means that it was something predating Nazi Germany. Yes. Now we might have a motivation for why the likes of Hermann Goering would sponsor an expedition to Antarctica and no, it's not the public story that he put out that he was interested in lubricants from whales. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're not going to go down there for that. That's no. <laughs> and that, that literally is the cover story. That, yeah. I mean, <laughs> you, yeah. Talk, <laughs> you talk about a whopper. You can kind of see Gary going, ha, ha, yeah. <laughs> Let's see if they buy this one. <laughs> but no, uh, it wow. makes sense. And yeah. then, and then, let's assume the premise of the story is true. Yes, that our ancestors up there, some of them survived somehow, and what they really need is some water and some air. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, wow. And so they decide to come here, and of course, having grown up on that frigid planet <laughs> after the disasters that befell it, yeah, maybe <laughs> Antarctica is the best place for you for now. <laughs> wow. So, you know, I, I'm at a loss to explain all of the goings on there, other than I have consistently said that when when the Secretary of State, even if it is a nutcase like John Ketchup Carey takes time off from a from a, a diplomatic junket in the middle of one of the most hotly contested elections in American history to go to Antarctica. What we're being told was that oh he just wanted to check in on climate change. Amazing. No, there's a diplomatic purpose for the visit. Wow. There's yeah. a diplomatic purpose for the Patriarch of Moscow going there. There's a diplomatic purpose for the Pope going there. Mm -hmm. There is a diplomatic purpose for King Juan Carlos and all the British royals that have been there. There's possibly even a diplomatic purpose for Buzz Aldrin going there. Mm -hmm. um, would, a, would a presence like that make sense? Yeah, I think it does. Oddly enough, it makes perfect sense. And so much the better if they're from Mars. Now, my problem with that scenario is if they have the advanced technology to get from there to here, mm -hmm, right? they probably have enough technology to make a little air and make a little water that they need, you know, <laughs> to keep the place, to keep the place uh, relatively livable. So, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm not buying the we need your air and water story very much. <laughs> I'll tell you what's so interesting uh, and how I even discovered the book. This is this is strange. There's so much up your alley that when I found it, I was like, oh, my God, you know, we, we have to talk about this. We have this. to talk about this one. <laughs> <laughs> in, the, uh, in the 1920s, you mentioned Fritz Lang. Yeah. Uh, incredible. You know, he, he did all the remarkable uh, Metropolis and all the oh, yeah. German incredible classics stuff. and then yeah. took off and – made yeah. things here in Hollywood. He fled the Nazis and who were after him a bit. Um, but what's interesting is you'll find that most of the people like Dornberger 
mm-hmm. like Von Braun, are working with him in a movie called Women on the Moon. Oh, yes, yes. Yes. And then they incorporate the uh-huh. logo of Woman on the Moon on the V2 so that all those V2s have that little logo. Yeah. And uh, I was like, oh, my God. But yeah. what's weird is the name of the club that they had, uh, Dornberger and all these other uh, guys that you would be familiar with on the German Nazi scientists side, was the Interplanetary Craft Society. Oh, wow. Oh my! Oh so, yeah, that, that in German that does make, raise yeah. I uh, I thought that you know, <laughs> I started thinking back to your Breakaway Civilization book when I saw that because the crisscross there was too much with von Braun, and then I was thinking, well, they had the Interplanetary Craft Club with Dornberger working with Fritz Lang contributing. Wow to this well not only that but you you, out of that whole set of fables that surrounds maria orsic and the real society yes her so-called channeled messages yes you have this you have this craft that she's trying to describe and she uses the german expression jenseits flugzeug other side aircraft oh interesting that's how that literally translates other side of what what do you mean other side wow you know other side of the veil of isis you know what are we talking about here incredible uh it's a very suggestive term um huh it, it yeah it suggests that there's all sorts of of maybe misread occult you know people are taking these terms in an occult sense and they don't mean that at all Ah, uh, they mean yes. you know something higher dimensional or you know of that nature. Um, I you know there there is something going on in Antarctica, and the only thing I think can explain the presence of so many strange people associated with the place. I mean, it's just a bizarre list. Wow. Anyway, it's like the only way to explain such a bizarre list is there's something diplomatic going on down there. Um, and it's, it's not secret summit meetings between the Pope and the patriarch, you know, (laughs) (laughs) right. But it suggests with Aldrin's presence, it suggests a space connection. It suggests a space connection. Isn't that fascinating? Wow. It has to, uh, and given all the other stuff going on down there that are space connected, you know, the neutrino thing, um, Lockheed Martian having a presence there. Uh, and I'm using Catherine's term for the f- for the firm. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I I would be a bit surprised that something like that scenario in that book is is going on down there. I would be a bit surprised. Wow, remarkable! Um, now, whether they're from Mars is another story. Uh, there are other good candidates in the solar system. <laughs> Excellent point. Yes. <laughs> Uh, the idea of Antarctica as a base, rather interesting, considering its history and considering that we know at a certain point there was no ice there. Yeah. So, uh, and might whoever is down there have some knowledge of the place without the ice? Yes. You know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it starts to chime. It, it starts. starts to chime. And not only that, there have been all these strange rumors recently, Daniel, where people claim to have found cliffs that have been exposed with ice breaking off and falling into the ocean, parts of the cliffs of, of the shoreline of, the, of Antarctica, where some people claim, and I, you know, I've, I've not investigated this to the point that I'm satisfied, but the claims are out there that some people are seeing Egyptian hieroglyphics and... Oh. And... Yeah, cuneiform ideograms. Fascinating on, on these cliffs. So if if there's an Egyptian and Sumerian connection to the place, <laughs> that, that yeah, the the, <laughs> the ante just got up once again. <laughs> that brings it up to the level. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, a crucial rewrite of history in the yeah. middle of all that. I had to mention before we go, um, and this is just absolutely been fascinating 
uh, <laughs> incredible. So there's so many things left on the cutting room floor of this <laughs> interview, but I'm going to say this recently, the son of Soros, George uh. Soros tweets out this very esoteric occult laden picture that has a bullet hole and I'll uh -huh. show it up on the screen. Uh -huh. And then we have this series of bills. There's a number of odd things that you've noticed about the bills that I wanted to put on the record here. One of the things that everybody's been pointing out is, hey, it adds up to 47, which is the next president. Mm -hmm. And there's been a lot of this in the air about assassination, uh, especially in relation to Trump with MSNBC saying, well, you know, Trump could get assassinated and kind of laying that in there as a kind of normalizing of the idea. Mm -hmm. And here is Soros saying it. What I found interesting was in the middle of those bills, a silver certificate, uh, obvious yeah. illusion to the last president who was assassinated in office, um, President Kennedy, in his silver certificates. So uh, the United States note, Joseph, what do you make of this public display? There are, okay, first of all, there are evangelicals out there saying and warning about an assassination attempt. And what if Trump gets shot in the head and survives? Wow. You know, vacuuming wow. the Antichrist. <laughs> <laughs> you know? and, and and my point in raising that is again to to raise what I've I've warned people about all, so many years. The fulfillment's the deception. Oh yes. Get this idea of dispensationalism out of your heads. Because that's not the way this works. It's not to say that the fulfillment isn't true. It's just to say, be on your guard. Oh, right. Because there is a... There is one thing that cannot be counterfeited with any claimant to be Christ. And people are going to have to think very long and hard about what that is. It's very easy and obvious, but it's also difficult. The other thing that struck me about it, even before all the evangelicals started, you know, jumping on the prophecies being fulfilled right before our eyes bandwagon, <laughs> is, and as you can tell, I'm a little skeptical. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not that I don't believe in the second coming and all that. But the other side of this coin is just the assassination people. You've got... I think, a clear threat being made against yeah. the former president. Yes. If this were being made on any other man, the federal government would already be investigating and have already arrested the perpetrator. Yes. In my opinion, Alex Soros right now should be before a judge asking for bail bond. Absolutely. My problem is, yeah, the symbolism of 47 is there. If you add up the money that is being shown, it totals up to 47. Like you say, there are two silver certificates, $1 bill silver certificates in that picture. It's clear as day if you know what a silver certificate looks like. The interesting thing are the other bills. Yeah. There is a 20, two tens, and a five. Right. And the 20 and one of the 10s are upside down mm -hmm. to total 30. And then you have the silver. So you have a suggestion. Someone emailed this to me. I forget who it was on my website. Emailed this reading to me that that totals up to 30 silver. And who's famous for 30 pieces of silver? Oh, isn't that fascinating? So there's yet another... We're uh, back in the New Testament. We're back in the New Testament, you know, symbolism game. Yes. Again. Um, and I, I'm sorry, folks. I just can't make comparisons between Donald Trump and Christ. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow that ain't computing for me. <laughs> but nonetheless, it's there. Mm -hmm. And it is part of the deliberate symbolism concocted by Soros himself or whoever did it for him. Mm. 
Yeah. And what it's suggesting to me is that they're that they've got a mole inside of the apostolus so to speak, <laughs> right. that yeah. is going to be responsible for setting him up. Oh wow. Uh, that that bothers me immensely. Yeah. Because that raises the question, well, who would that be? Mm-hmm. Because you know, it's not as if the guy has 12 other guys following him around everywhere. Right. And the only people really doing any speaking for him are members of his family. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm wondering what the heck is going on here? Who have you got around him? Is it someone that you've snuck into his security detail? Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, what, what's going on here? Um, And the allusion to Kennedy is that, yeah, if we can pull his security, Mm -hmm. we can interfere with yours. No question. Uh, that's what bothers me about that's it. That's shocking. I, what a that's shocking thing. Shocking. And um, it is interesting because a couple of things happened just before. One was Vivek, who was in Iowa, right, gave a speech on UFOs. Right. When the UFO file starts talking about how, how we need to get the UFO file out. Then he quits his campaign and joins Trump in New right. Hampshire. And right. he's rah rah for Trump, and then uh, Trump goes into oh Uncle John was so good to me and he's looking down on us now you know <laughs> no reason to mention John but he does uh-huh. so there we are again with that strange crisscross it's a reference sort of saying you know remember when you mess with me you mess with that that right yeah, yeah. Um, and so then you get this weird Soros yeah. Uh, that seems to me a very strange progression. It's strange only if that off the world connection is not involved in the political cycle. Ah. I personally think that that off world involvement has been there involved in the political cycle at least since 9-11. That's when I think it really steps onto the stage. Um, We might be even looking at several factions. You know, good guys, bad guys. Fascinating. Uh, The way I read it is I think Trump is speaking code to the people that know how how to decode the steganography, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Um, this is the guy that, you know, said that we needed another Space Force. And please note the word another. Yes. <laughs> you know, when he said that, I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, you what, caught that. What, what we have is, that. It, yeah. is it sufficient? <laughs> we need another one now. Um, and again, the Space Force... Give me the UFO file back under executive control. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Something something is going on and it's space related. There there's no doubt in my mind. When you add all of the, you know, Antarctica, Von Brown, Jefferson mm-hmm. Davis, and you know, whatever's going on in Texas <laughs> at the time. I uh, want to hear more about that too. I, I I you know, you can feel that you're onto something. That That's humanity. all I have at the moment. You know, I, I'm I, I'm so dumbfounded by what I've been reading and thinking, and how to get it all into a book. Please don't, please don't steal my ideas, folks, and write. Your own book. <laughs> you know, I, I'm don't don't be an Annie Jacobson with me here. <laughs> let let me get the book out first. But um, don't you know Dr. Mengele set up all those uh, Roswell <laughs> aliens? Come on, <laughs> she's a genius. <laughs> Jesus, <laughs> that's one of the worst things I've ever seen in my life. It's an awful book. <laughs> it's just anyway, <laughs> what do you expect? For, uh, no, I can't say that. <laughs> I sometimes you just have to bite your tongue, Farrell. 
But, uh, <laughs> hey, look, 60 Minutes gave her her own section on their oh, show. I come know. On. <laughs> I just, you know, come on, guys. Do a little real digging and research. Don't, <laughs> don't be such CIA lap poodles. Uh, it was uh, Mengele and Stalin. They did it together. Mengele and Stalin. <laughs> well, golly. <laughs> There's a duo for you. Buddies together again. <laughs> Buddies together again and forever. <laughs> this is the weirdest theory of all. <laughs> Definitely came out of the CIA. They're like, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, guys, I got one for you. Let's put out that Stalin and Mengele are working together on it. <laughs> <this. laughs> oh, they created those gray aliens. <laughs> Nice. <laughs> Joseph, incredible. Absolutely fascinating uh, today. And, and we look forward to your book and we look forward to no one ripping it off in between the time you've mentioned it here and it coming out. Well, I hope not. You know, <laughs> otherwise I'm going to have to write the other book I'm thinking about. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> I want to hear about that as well. Uh, <laughs> Well, it's going to be, if I write that book, it's going to be about everything from the Confederacy to the papacy. <laughs> <laughs> Just for, if you want to put Mengele and Stalin together. <laughs> hey, don't Why worry, not? you know, because Ancient Aliens is doing a special Cowboys and Aliens. Hey, don't oh, worry. For <laughs> <laughs> they did a movie on that already. <laughs> right, exactly. We don't need another one. It's broke back aliens. There you go. <laughs> it's <laughs> broke back <laughs> aliens. <laughs> Annie Jacobson was the script consultant. That's it. <laughs> I'm going to be laughing about that the rest of the <laughs> You know, they some people say the octopuses come from off this planet. <laughs> oh my! Everything, uh, Joseph. It's all available at GizaDeathStar.com. Yeah. Um, uh, the yeah. New all, book. All my books are there on the website. They can order them right off. <laughs> order them right off the list. <laughs> I, uh, considering what we just talked about, this book is such a classic. And oh, yeah, uh, Covert Wars and the Clash of Civilizations. This is a remarkable book and way, way ahead of its time, at least 10 years ahead of its time. Uh, okay. Reading so much like what's playing out now, and people are still catching up to this book. I highly recommend it. But Demons in the Acre is the new one, yeah. And um, Joseph, just incredible stuff. And uh, we look forward to having you back really soon. Thanks for having me, Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> Great to see you, sir. Good to see you. Thank you for joining us for this special interview with Dr. Joseph Farrell. You can find Dr. Farrell's work at GizaDeathStar.com. Please join us on Friday nights live here at 8 p.m. Eastern for the Dark Journalist X series. Save the date of Friday, February 23rd for a very special two-hour presentation. See you soon. <laughs>